A very good afternoon to all of you. As uh, you have seen, we have brought this, uh, this report together along with the Observer Research Foundation. We have, it's a great pleasure for us to be launching this, uh, this book, uh, which we have put together uh, based on eight interventions uh, from across the country to showcase how data has been used for development. This book basically explores eight, these eight interventions uh, in terms of uh, how the data is gathered, processed, and uh, how the data insights have been used to create, to create social impact. The publication showcases uh, the importance of and innovative ways of uh, using microdata for impactful outcomes. And this is data, microdata that's collected at the grassroots. The crit critical thing is about how microdata can be useful in terms of creating solutions for impactful uh, development. The fourth industrial revolution, characterized by a fusion of technologies that blur the lines between physical, digital, and biological spheres, has created an unprecedented amount of data that can be con collected, analyzed, and used to drive development. With a population of about 1.4 billion people, India generates vast amounts of data that can be harnessed to drive development initiatives. As India is recognized by many as representing the interests of the Global South, both within and beyond the G20, there is no better time than now to integrate the data for development approach into the global development agenda. Data is being used to drive development in various sectors. This publication showcases how organizations in India are using data to drive development in the sectors of health, education, disaster preparedness, women empowerment, and agriculture. Just a couple of examples I want to mention here for illustration. One of them is in the health sector. Uh, this is a project we did in partnership with a few other organizations uh, in the maternal and child health space, where the data, the micro data was being used by the care providers at the site, while the administration was using the data, using dashboards to design the interventions. The, another example I can use here for illustration is uh, the work that we are doing in Assam in the flood affected district of Kachar, where we are working with the communities in terms of using that micro data and using also the geospatial data and the geotagged geo assets to design interventions to prepare the communities for any disasters that come across, that they come across. I mean, all of us are familiar with the kind of uh, flood situation that exists in Assam from time to time. So those are a couple of examples, and there are many, uh, uh, six other such examples from different parts of the country in different sectors using uh, AI for uh, precision agriculture, then you have uh, uh, ed tech initiatives and so on. Overall, data has the potential to play a significant role in driving development in the fourth industrial revolution. By leveraging the power of data and technology-based solutions, India can make more informed decisions, target resources more efficiently and effectively, and work towards a more sustainable and equitable future, while making progress towards development goals. These copies of the publication are available here in this room as well as outside. Uh, we encourage you all to go through that and share your feedback. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And thank you to everyone here. It's wonderful to be in uh, beautiful India once again. Uh, in the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing how technology can and, and should, that's my uh, uh, anecdote, should lift communities. Uh, we have speakers here from the private and public sectors, so a very diverse panel from different geographies and different perspectives to discuss. Before we dive in, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Yael Wisner Levy. I'm coming to you from Tel Aviv, Israel. I am leading communications for a startup that is now a public company called Lemonade. Uh, I came from the public sector and I made the transition to the private sector. And Lemonade is a funny name. It's an insurance company. It's a pretty funny name for an insurance company. Um, but the reason I am I, here today is because Lemonade uh, 
besides it being a for-profit company being traded on the New York Stock Exchange, we're also a certified B Corp and a public benefit corporation, which means that we have a double bottom line. We are what you would call, I hope, a business uh, for good. Uh, public benefit corporations have this double bottom line. That means that we're committed, of course, to uh, creating shareholder value and to financial results. But we're also committed to thinking about the public good in every kind of business decision that we make. And we're hold, upholding very high standards of environment, sustainability, and others. And this obviously gives us this, the, this structure, gives us the foundation to really uh, balance how we run our business. Um, and today I'm happy to say that there are many companies uh, traded publicly that are B Corps, uh, B corporations and public benefit corporations. So this is not just a trend and I hope this is something that will uh, stay for years to come. Um, and so now to our panel, um, I'm coming also from Tel Aviv today, uh, which is also bringing together communities of, of high tech and others uh, in the public service and the public uh, discussions there. But today I would like to discuss uh, really uh, from a very ground uh, roots uh, perspective about how access to technology still remains um, very disparse for most of the world. I would say about half of the world still does not even have access to basic digital opportunities, including the internet. Um, I want to start with a very kind of broad question, and I ask that each of our panelists uh, kind of take their experience and where they're coming from exactly to answer this. And it really is, what are the barriers today, knowing that half of the world doesn't have access to the internet? What are the barriers in your respective fields from where you're coming from today to us that are preventing the spread of digitization and the access to technology um, to the, to mostly to the communities that need it most, and I would start with you, uh, Minister. Yeah, no, thank you for having this very important session. I think as far as uh, my region is concerned, I'm coming from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is a middle-income country until very recently, which we are now downgraded after the recent uh, economic turmoil. The, the, the problems that we have in Sri Lanka, as far as uh, concerned, we have uh, universal free education there. With that, there is good uh, education prospect, but the, the amount of investment and a clear policy, consistent policy, uh, a lack of policy is a problem for us. Then, of course, uh, educating uh, our young kids with the skills and upskills of this is a challenge for us. And uh, the technology, the access to the technology and kind of affordability of it is a problem in terms of uh, uh, internet penetration, as well as the charges which have been levied on that, and also the devices. So these are challenges that we have, but more or less the challenges are going to be consistent government policy, uh, political will on top, um, and then follow up action, and continuous learning and continuous improvement. These are challenges which we have to overtake. Comparatively, we have uh, made a lot of progress during the pandemic uh, because it forced kind of thing. We, we, you call it as that uh, necessity is the mother of all inventions and that actually happened uh, in Sri Lanka, but long way to go. So the challenges remain and, and the potential are enormous. So we probably have to look at it and, and the leaders and the politicians and the governments need to invest on that and in, invest con consistently. And I also say something, it is time that this, the, given the enormous potential which is available there, something like on a WHO kind of thing where our health services are very, very good, where they come and look at all our things and we have managed uh, almost on par with inter, uh, high, uh, I mean developed countries. So for this, you need to have an international organization looking at digitalization, looking at every aspect of it in terms of investment, in terms of training, in terms of policies and all those things, so that you really give that uh, opportunity for everybody across the world. And that, that's a good segue uh, to Minister al -Olama. You're the first AI minister in the world, um, and uh, you're coming to us from the UAE. Can, can you answer that first question, but also why, why is there a minister for AI? Thank you very much. I think um, I've been answering this question for five years, so <laughs> I, I think I've, I've gotten enough practice. But the reality of the matter is today it's very different uh, with the, the arrival of things like ChatGPT and DALI and some of the other platforms that are generative AI platforms that are changing the world. Uh, it's becoming apparent that countries need uh, regulation 
positive regulation, not hindering innovation, but also need to be prepared for a future where a lot of things are going to be disrupted, whether it's jobs, whether it's you know, societal norms, and whether it's uh, how people are able to actually forecast and foresee the future. So we've been working for five years on this. Uh, I think uh, maybe we have a head start, but many other countries are going to have a minister for AI. On your first question, uh, honestly, I think it's not a one size fits all approach because we are talking about access to internet, but the, the reality of the matter is many countries don't have, a, a, or many communities in the world, don't have access to electricity or dependable electricity. Why are we talking about the internet when the technology necessary for us to use the devices that will connect us to the internet still does not exist in certain communities? I think that there is going to be a leapfrog. So with uh, the advent of uh, platforms like Starlink, for example, from SpaceX and Elon Musk, we are going to see communities where you know, there is no need for us to have fiber or to have you know, ground-based connections. We'll just connect directly to, to satellite. But still, without electricity, they will not be able to make use of these innovations. The, the role of governments is to constantly look at the best ways for them to provide the, the meaningful, not just regulations, but incentives to provide the basic infrastructure necessities that uh, exist in these places, whether it's sanitary necessities for infrastructure, whether it's energy uh, infrastructure as well. And then the second thing is, I think we are going to, you know, we're driving the truck towards the wall directly, because what's happening is if you're not developing these communities, there's going to be more and more pressure on cities, which is going to give you a different set of challenges, whether it's pollution, whether it's access to certain services in centralized areas and, and across the city, whether it's you know, traffic problems and, and, and much more uh, of that sort of problems. What needs to happen is there needs to be a specific target to provide basic needs across communities in these countries. Also allow people to choose. If I do not want to move into uh, urban dwellings, I can work from communities that are elsewhere. And of course, when you talk about India, the challenges are probably different sheerly because of the vast uh, geographies that you have to uh, cover. Samir was calling you, uh, Jay Panda, the tech evangelist of India. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure your perspective will be welcome. Well, in the sphere of politics, I've been arguing for the use of technology and a lot has happened. Instead of trying to give a comprehensive answer, let me just illustrate by using two or three brief examples. So turn the clock back eight years or so, and the vast majority of Indians didn't even have access to a banking account. And the old traditional model of bank branches was not scalable for a variety of reasons. Tech came to the rescue, and uh, uh, the Modi government started something called the JAM Trilogy. Jandhan accounts, these were accounts that were opened by mandate uh, without any money to begin with. Uh, Aadhaar, which is the uh, biometric system, the largest in the world, and mobiles. And as a result of the, uh, the shift to, from inefficient delivery of traditional services to direct uh, benefits transfer, cash transfer, there's been a phenomenal turnaround. So half a billion new bank accounts were opened. Half a billion. Just think of the scale of that. Um, well over $300 billion worth of benefits have been transferred without any leakage, without inefficiency. Uh, tens of billions of savings. How did the savings come about? Because of the JAM Trilogy, you deduplicated fake beneficiaries. And about 100 million fake beneficiaries were removed, which used to be there because of the old system. Um, in the meantime, India now has 900 million internet users. Very affordable in the range of two and a half dollars. Well over 600 million smartphones. And I'll conclude by giving two examples of how this is leading to ongoing transition. So there are, this is a game changer for the MSME sector, the micro and small enterprises sector, of which India has about 60 million. Of those 60 million micro and small enterprises, over 95% are micro, and uh, uh, about 60% are rural. And uh, they have become enabled because of this banking connectivity and internet connectivity into uh, totally transitioning uh, rural communities, poorer communities, into getting more opportunities, more jobs, uh, more uh, trade. Um, 
I will conclude by pointing out that the new thrust now is, uh, there are many, but I'll just cite one, uh, agriculture for instance. We still have hundreds of millions of Indians still involved in agriculture, and uh, the thrust now with the new digital agriculture mission to use AI, to use blockchain, remote sensing, robots and drones is going to be transformational for yet many uh, hundreds of uh, millions of Indians. Uh, and, and this is how communities are being lifted out. So the last word I want to say is, uh, with combination of this and many other such activities, extreme poverty in India, which used to be a perennial problem, is down to now less than 1%. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yodi, your, your perspective here is different. You're coming from more of the health tech uh, perspective. And I'd like to understand also to answer the first question, but also exactly the challenges specific to the health uh, tech area, because it's very different, I think, than simply not having access to the internet. There's more challenges there. Crumbs. <laughs> Thank you, Yael. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here in this um, esteemed panel. And my first thing, my first question is when you said that it's the first AI um, minister, I wanted to ask whether he was real or whether he is AI. Um, <laughs> so I sort of looked a little at him then, and we'll have that conversation later. Um, Chat, he wrote his answer. <laughs> um, no, really an, uh, an honor to be here. And I sort of did wonder why I was invited, because I'm not very smart. I don't know very much about tech. I'm a medical doctor by profession, and I sort of, um, as you heard, I, I chair the Africa Union Vaccine Delivery Alliance and also um, WHO Special Envoy for, for, for the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. But i am also recently um, been appointed chair of FIND Diagnostics, which is a health tech company, and I'll, I'll get to the aspects of that in a minute. But digital technology, I also want to go to something that Minister um, Omar said about electricity and talk about going back to the basics, because we're talking about how this affects communities. And the reality is that yesterday we heard in one of the ministerial sessions, I believe it was Bill Gates, talk about tech for, for education and tech for healthcare. And before we begin to think about the highfalutin things, we have to recognize that tech is meant to work for us. We're not meant to work for tech. And tech is meant to improve humanity. And um, we need to go back to the basics. And, um, you know, even in the last panel on the G20, they started to speak about education, about climate, and about health. And I, I, I think that the world has forgotten that half, half of the world, or more than half of the world, don't have access to the basics of electricity that will enable them to, to enjoy the benefits of tech. It's wonderful to hear the, the India story. And, and I mean, I'm, I have become an India story evangelist. We talked about that also earlier. Because India did such an incredible job in the health space during COVID with vaccinations, and that was enabled through technology, through the Cohen, I think it was, it was called, the, you know, the, the platform. And what, what COVID showed us was the disparities that we live in a world of haves and have-nots. We live in a world of haves and have-nots in, in tech. We live in the world of haves and have-nots where big tech controls what tech looks like. So we had a little mini conversation earlier about artificial intelligence that does not recognize brown and black bodies because we need to be involved from the discovery to the delivery part of the equation. We have, you talked about health tech. During COVID, people died because the little oximeter that was meant to measure the levels of oxygen in their, in their blood did not measure properly for brown bodies and for black people because we are not involved in the co creation of that. So, I mean, my question speaks to how do we make tech, I'm a practical person, how do we make tech practical for communities? How do we make it work? You know, like um, we just heard in India, I, I come from Nigeria, a country that's just had elections that quite frankly were destroyed by tech because you can't, you know, th th there was a, a promise and a hope of elections that were going to be results that were going to be uploaded by biometric systems and, and, and controlled in that way. If we don't have trust in, in what we have, if we are not involved in the creation and the building of it, we have to look at the manipulations that are happening around the world that we're talking about at the moment. Tech has been both a, a strength and it has been a huge weakness. So, you know, th there's this sort of dichotomy because of, for me, a lack of inclusion in the 
in, in, in the very creation of it. So when we look at how tech has evolved over the years, it's incredible to see what's going on in UAE and, and, and many parts of the world. Um, it's incredible to see how it is being taken down to community level here in India. But I look at my life in Abuja, Nigeria, where having to chair a global meeting every Thursday for the last year and a half, two years of global leaders on COVID, I had to organize to have a cable dug through my street so that I had the technology required to be able to connect with the rest of the world, and yet I have privilege. So how about those who do not have that privilege, who do not have that capability? We're not, we're not, considering, we're not considering them. So how do we make tech work for communities is being, by, by being more inclusive and speaking more to communities about where they need to be, about the global south learning from one another. We need more south to south learnings and platforms on how did tech work for India. You know, India 1.4 billion, for me, Africa 1.34 billion people. How do we learn one from another and compare those? How do we have people within our communities building tech that is not necessarily highfalutin, but that it is practical for our own solutions. I'll leave it there. Thank you, and we're going to... And in our next round, I do want to get into the lack of inclusion in tech and how we can uh, improve that through tech. Uh, actually, I mean, that could be a, a solution. Uh, the other part of the solution may be the private sector. Um, <laughs> for lack of uh, sometimes of the public sector. And Gautam, I would love to hear from you how, uh, the, how you see the private sector uh, taking part in, in access to technology and specifically what MasterCard has been doing. Yeah, sure. So I think um, as, as uh, uh, we talked about the fact that policies have to exist there for, for the ecosystem to exist. But I think inclusive or access to technology, in, in our opinion, really has three pillars, right? The technology that we build has to be innovative, right? It has to be simple to understand for everybody to use. The second pillar is it has to be accessible, right? Uh, or call it inclusive, right? If you're solving for use cases or problem statements that are not relevant for whoever you're targeting that technology for, it won't do the job. Right? So that's a very important pillar. And the third pillar is safety. I think you touched upon it. If I'm used to doing something in a certain manner, in my world, you know, I come from MasterCard in payments, right? If I am used to using cash in my world and suddenly technology comes in and I say I'm going to use technology, but if I don't feel safe about how my money is moving, I will not use it. So it has to be safe. I think those three pillars, being inclusive, innovative, and safe, are the ways you can use technology to be accessible to societies that we talk about. Now in MasterCard, you know, what we are trying to do with this is of course, you know, we figure out a, a segment of society that we want to target, you know, in, in countries it's, it varies. In, in this part of the world, we said we want to go for the farmers, we want to go for the women, we want to go for the MSMEs. So we have partnered with entities that play in the space to understand the problems in these segments and then bring technology that, that helps them. So as an example, for MSMEs, We've actually uh, started this program called the Digital Suction Program, right? Where we're actually educating SME, SMEs, uh, about 300,000 SMEs that we're targeting this year. We've already got to a 10% of that number with, in partnership with the CII. Where essentially what we're doing is we're educating MSMEs on the use of technology, whether it's for payments, whether it is for beyond payments, whether it's, it's, it's just managing their money, it's, it's all of that, right? Then the second partnership, which is actually a long-standing partnership of ours with the CIIT, which is the Confederation of All India Traders, uh, we've been partnering with them for a long, long time. Uh, we have about 14 cities, you know, tier two, tier three cities. We've actually gone to the CIIT traders and we're educating them how to get access to uh, accepting digital payments, right, in, in various forms. And we're actually helping them deploy that. Right, so that's the MSME uh, cover. On the on the women's side, you know, we we've just started. We just partnered with this program called Sheshakti, right, where we are trying to basically go to women, first time entrepreneurs, first gen, second gen entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs who do not have an understanding of business, right? How do we help them be better entrepreneurs? So again, in that space, we're targeting about 40,000 women in this year alone, where we will go and educate women and get them access to technology that they don't have today, right? Likewise, in the farmer space, you know, we, we have a program called Farm Pass, right? It's part of a larger program called Community Pass, where we want to target farmers. Look, in our world, we are basically a two-sided network, right? We've learned that as a two-sided network, we can create value for suppliers and, and producers, right, and, and, and consumers. So because of which we've put together this 
platform for the farmers specifically, where they can go and they can basically interact with their producers, with their, with their, with their buyers, and get, get real value for their produce. We've already got about a million farmers on that system today in India alone. We're targeting another nine million in the next three years. We're making sure that the use cases that we're putting onto these platforms are relevant, easy to understand, safe and secure. And I think that those three things are important pillars for the private sector to play. And so, thank you very much. I, I agree, but for the private sector to uh, flourish and, and play those parts, we need a, a public sector that will welcome them, or vice versa. I would like to understand from the, from the public sector folks here, how do you convince more traditional societies to make that change towards tech, uh, to embrace kind of tech, to, to have a driver through societies that may not have all access to certain uh, needs like electricity and that we, you must need, but also that to create a mindset that looks towards uh, technology as a, as a way to build resilience and to build kind of a, a new future. How do you convince the unconvinced? Anyone, yeah. Okay, um, <laughs> look, uh, why does technology exist in the first place? There needs to be value created. Mm -hmm. And that value is what convinces people. You cannot force people to use something that they will not extract value from. And we see that, for example, if we go to, to the recent example of, let's say, chat GPT, why are people signing up in droves? Why do we have 100 million people register over the last you know, two months since it was um, uh, announced from November to January uh, to actually subscribe to using this platform? It's because it creates value. And I think that there is no um, um, conflict of having your own culture, your own tradition, and embracing technology. And a great example of this is India. So India as a country is a country that still is deeply rooted in its heritage and its culture, but is leading the technological revolution globally. So you see all of the top tech entrepreneurs, tech CEOs are Indian um, in terms of their ethnicity. And the same is true in the UAE. So we have a minister, so our minister of, currently she's a minister of education, but she was our minister for advanced technology at one point of time, led our Mars program and our probe to go to Mars. And if you look at her, she's like every other young woman in the UAE that wears the traditional clothes, that speaks our language, that did not have to look different or speak differently to lead this very complex program. And creating role models is very important because sometimes when the value is a, a long tail value, where you get it actually over many years, seeing people that look like you, that speak your language, that embrace it, allows you to actually try it, rather than having someone that looks very different to you coming and telling you, you know, if you do not use this, you're not going to be a part of the future. And this is what I saw when, when I was appointed as Minister of Artificial Intelligence. Um, we did not wait for someone to tell us, you have to embrace AI. We did not follow another country. It was not like the UAE went and emulated someone else. We thought that this is important. Our leadership said that we need to be a part of this. And they went and they you know, appointed a young man uh, to lead this revolution. People ask about age and you know, the thing is, uh, His Highness um, the, the President, our current President and also our Prime Minister, said uh, early on that this is a technology that will come with a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities as it you know, evolves. And we need someone that is young, dynamic and able to live that long tail to ensure that the future is positive rather than negative. So practicing inclusivity to, to, to the extent that you can. So 33% of our cabinet is women. 50% of our parliament is women in the UAE. If anything, seeing the rate of progress, I think that women are going to beat men in every job uh, in, in the coming years. They're, they're, they're exceptional. And honestly, it's been a long um, uh, kind of enablement process uh, from the government. You know, uh, probably 20 years ago, our leadership said, not having women be part of the progress is like living on one lung or trying to clap with one hand. 50% of our population is women. So we cannot exclude them. And today, I think they are enabling us to do all of these incredible things. Come on. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment about convincing the unconvinced? Um, in the case of India, yeah. we had a situation where the country is naturally entrepreneurial. We have thousands of years of tradition, which had been suppressed by statist policies mm -hmm. for quite a long time. And that has been unleashed through uh, uh, partnerships between government, the public sector, and the private sector. Mm -hmm. And this huge demographic benefit that we have of the world's 
largest working age population below the age of 35 now enabled online. So just to give you an example, the government has got out of areas that it doesn't need to be in, such as airlines and hotels, where uh, investment needed a thrust, like infrastructure for instance. The government has led the charge, but in partnerships. So massive highways and expressways, ports and airports, with uh, uh, both public and private sector participation. And some of these are now becoming global players. In the process, uh, because of the examples that I had given earlier, you have hundreds of millions of Indians, especially younger Indians, uh, getting involved and getting convinced that this is an India where they can flourish, as opposed to an earlier generation who felt they had to go out of India to have these opportunities. So the startup uh, world, for example, India has now become the third largest uh, startup ecosystem in the world. Uh, just eight or nine years ago, we had about 700 startups. Today, we have nearly 85,000, uh, more than 100 unicorns. And the best thing about this is, uh, you hear about the Bengalurus and the Mumbais and, and the Gurgaos, but a lot of these startups are coming from mid and smaller sized towns around the country. I think I would like to add on that. Um, you, you said the unconvinced, to convince them. I don't see the private sector as unconvinced, right? Because if we believe we are creating value, which we do, we believe, I think then we will participate in this space. I think when the policies are there, when the government ecosystem has the right, you know, policies around there, the, the, the private sector will participate. And that's what we are seeing, in, in, at least in the, in the payments world, that, you know, we are seeing a very inclusive society, you know, not just in India, everywhere in the world today, electronic payments is becoming a national agenda for that sense. And so it becomes, it, it becomes actually good for us as well. So we are definitely convinced that this is the place to be. Creating value of values. Uh, Minister. Uh, if I just share a couple of experience from Sri Lanka, not in the same uh, scale in what you have seen in UAE and India. Uh, during the pandemic, I remember when we were in the government, we took a decision that uh, all the applications for the GCA level should be done online. So there was a lot of resistance from the old guard saying that this is unfair, people will not be able to do, how many people will have access to it. But anyway, we went ahead with it. But 97% uh, actually applied online anyway. So we, sometimes what happens is the, the, the public is much more in front than us. You, you need to give them the opportunity. One other example was we had a huge, you would have seen that during the, uh, the, the massive uh, uh, economic pro problems we had, we had about five, six days long uh, the, the queues uh, for fuel. Then what we did with the private sector, we got all uh, involved in that and introduced a QR code where every vehicle, about 6.5 million vehicle, had to get registered it. They can only get a particular quota for a month uh, uh, per, per week. So you have to get the QR code and go there. So then the, again, the problem came, how you expect these, uh, uh, the, the, the three wheel drivers could come and get this QR code and they are not technologically enhanced. But we did was we uh, got uh, the, the youth clubs in Sri Lanka to go and help them to prepare that QR code. And it's all perfectly worked and 6.5 million Sri Lankan vehicle got registered on that. And overnight we were able to get the, uh, uh, the queues out and then the black market was out of it and people start knowing that I can only have this much of fuel for this week. They, they shape their uh, travel requirement accordingly and it brought peace to the country and then there was relative stability. And along the way, it also reduced our, our fuel uh, bill by about 40%. So it, it helped us to protect our foreign currency and stabilize the economy. So this is the, uh, a very innovative way of using the technology uh, in fighting those uh, unexpected crises. So there is a lot of success stories, uh, though there are challenges remain. Absolutely, and a lot of it will come in more policy. Yes, Dr. Yodi. No, I, um, I just want to raise something about the, the, the issue around women, which I, I mean, I think some excellent examples and really commendable from, from the UAE and of course many other parts of the world. But we must remember that, you know, women are still remain 7% less likely than men um, to use the internet, um, to own a mobile phone, and I think it's 16% less likely to use the internet. And I want to also use a practical example. In my private life, I do a lot of, a lot of work with women in communities that have been affected with con by conflict and crisis, women who have been abducted in northeast Nigeria, the Lake Chad region, working with those women and trying to get them 
into the sort of small SMEs, trying to get them making baskets, weaving, trying to get them bank loans. And one of the barriers that we faced is very much, you know, we, again, back to South to South learnings. One of the barriers we faced was that you, you would try to register these women on a platform, on a, on, you know, with, with a mobile phone, even giving them mobile phones, but they needed permission from a man. They needed permission from a man to be able to be registered. And oftentimes they would come to you with their husband or partners or father or brother's mobile phone, which meant that whatever payments were going to them were, were, were going to that individual. And this speaks to the policy aspect of, of, of tech, and it speaks to the accessibility. And so for those in the public space, I mean, these are some of the things, yes, there's some countries here on up on stage that are addressing it properly, but we need to speak openly about the greater inclusivity for women and the fact that they we are half the sky and the fact that, yes, we are half the or more of the world's population. And if we unleashed the power of women in technology, we would all, all, all over the world, I mean, places like Africa, of course, it's already been done here, here in, in, in India, we would see a revolution such as we would never believe in, in maternal health care, in child care, in, in education, because you educate a woman, you educate an entire community, you give her the power of technology and the power to herself design AI or design whatever chat GPT is going to do for her and her kids and imagine what could happen. And so I think, again, back to the practicalities of, of, of the matter, policies, and part of what, you know, this is, of course, this is the Racina Forum, but it's back to back with the G20. I, and in this year of India's G20 presidency, I think this is one of the things we really should call for, that, 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 that people start to speak and these governments start to speak to the practicality of what is going to transform lives across the world. We saw during COVID that technology could make a difference. You and I did not have to fly to places. So we can educate kids if only they have access. To, and it has to be simple. It has to be based in our own reality. It has to be based in the reality of, of a place that has no electricity or that we, I have to walk or, or, or take a bus for you know maybe three hours to go and charge my little tablet. How do we design things that are made for us, by us, to benefit us so that we can engage with the rest of the world? We start by having women at the, at the decision-making table and the policy-making table. That's right. Uh, and we want to have some questions from our uh, delegates, uh, from the Rosinia uh, Fellows. Uh, we, we can take a couple of questions. So um, while you guys get ready, oh, oh, we have Thank you very much. My name is Erik. I come from the Norwegian Development Agency, and we work together with, among other actors from India and Sri Lanka, on building and maintaining digital public goods and infrastructure, such as payment systems, national ID, etc. These are supposed to be open, safe, and accessible for everyone. So my question to you is, how can we make sure that more countries are able to implement these at scale to replicate the success of India? I, can answer that. I think that's a great question. And uh, the Indian example, uh, one of the key aspects of what is being called the India stack is the UPI, the Universal Payments uh, Interface, which has uh, got India to transition to becoming the fastest growing and, and uh, likely the biggest market for digital transactions. So UPI transactions in December, just this last December alone, were 7 billion transactions at effectively zero cost. Now, because of the scale, uh, this is now getting adopted in other countries. Just last week, there was a partnership with Singapore. So the UPI interface is now extended to Singapore. It's already been extended to countries in Europe. And so uh, this couldn't have been developed in countries that had smaller scale, even if they had the technology even if they had the uh, paying capacity, because it needs the scale. And, and I was very impressed when uh, I already mentioned about the CoWin platform, which is yet another example. Because using technology, we developed the platform, we developed, India developed its own vaccine during the pandemic, and rolled out the biggest vaccination campaign in history, with well over 2 billion vaccinations and was able to also assist other countries with several hundred millions of, of, of vaccines. 
So uh, this sort of, as far as India is concerned, we have an ancient philosophy which the Prime Minister uh, cites called Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which translates to the world is one family. And these are examples which I think can be extended on a variety of other initiatives to use the scale and technological developments of one nation to build a network that helps uh, many nations. Mr. Minister Alam, how do you how do you take all what you've done in the UAE and make sure that there's a minister of AI in other countries? So, so I don't think I can export myself yet. <laughs> you can, but but um, technology no. allows it. <laughs> uh, so so there, there are a few things that I would say. The first is we've launched something in the UAE called the Government Exchange Excellence Program, which literally means that every single technological platform that is developed in the UAE is made available uh, to any country that wants to leverage it and use it. We have over uh, 10 countries around the world that are actually uh, using these technologies and we're helping them actually embrace the best of the UAE experience. Because uh, as India believes and as the UAE believes, the only way forward is for all of us to benefit rather than specific countries or specific individuals to benefit. The other thing we're doing, and this is related to India, is um, I have incredible relationships here with the ministers and the government that are very progressive and forward thinking. And we agreed that the UAE uh, can also work with India to export the uh, India stack to other countries that are looking to uh, embrace it and to use it. And we are a third party here. We have nothing to benefit. What we want to do is ensure that the best technology gets into the best hands. And we've seen a lot of interest uh, from countries. We were hoping to sign at the World Government Summit, which is a global platform that takes place in the UAE. But um, I think bureaucracy at times um, gets in the way of ambition. Um, you know, the Indians were ready, we were ready, but it did not go through. Uh, hopefully, over the coming months, we're going to see a lot more of that happen. So any country that has something that wants to export to the world can bring it to uh, you know, the UAE, and we can help them do that as well. Wonderful. We'll take another question. My name is Shai Bialik. I'm also from Israel. I would like to start with thank uh, Lemonade and the entire high tech community for doing everything they can to protect the democracy of Israel. And I would like to take um, your words on gender, which are very important, especially as this year, Women's International Day uh, Summit topic is gender digi digital uh, access to all. And I would like to, if um, uh, the public sector, I'm sorry, MasterCard, you're an example for all of us. But if the public sector can uh, talk on how you're going to implement um, elimination of gender bias in digital analysis and AI, um, and what policies are we going to see in the, in the coming future to make sure that women have access to education as well as technology. Thank you. Thank you. Who would, like to, okay. would, would you like to start? I'm not. I'm not public spec sector, I think. <laughs> let me go to public. Let me, let me take a short stab at it. That's a great question. Technology can indeed enable inclusivity of various underprivileged sections of society. And women, of course, are the largest section that have been traditionally uh, denied access to many services. So uh, some of the examples that I gave means that you know, you, when you have 900 million um, internet users, uh, an increasing number of them are women. You have uh, students, you have um, uh, many other uh, women who are uh, small-scale entrepreneurs working in rural areas who have access to this technology and have become self-sufficient through their own efforts, such as through women's self-help groups. And the, the, the benefit of technology is that in the past, when without technology you used to try and deliver some service to the women, it wasn't assured that the women would actually benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Whereas a bank account opened in a woman's own name right. with her biometrics means she and only she gets to have control over that benefit that reaches her. So this is having a transformational effect uh, around the country. And there are many, many examples that we could cite. Can I weigh in on this for a second, please? Uh, I think... Um, this is the role of government. This is why governments exist. It's to ensure that all of society is considered rather than a portion of society. 
right? So it is our role. It's not something that someone is going to bring to the table and say that, oh, what are you guys thinking of women or not? Some governments are not doing a good job on this. So I think it's important for us to constantly remind government officials that you are here to ensure that technology represents everyone equally. But what actually is heartwarming to me, if you think about technologies like, for example, self-driving technologies, there are a lot of women today that are sitting on the leadership uh, side, not just on the, the receiving end of technologies. So there's a company called Zooks, and there's a woman called Aisha Evans, who's of Senegalese origin, that's actually leading this company. If you even look at something like ChatGPT, the chief technology officer of OpenAI that created that technology is a woman. Her name is uh, Mira Murati. So the fact of the matter is, I think women today are not being considered as a byproduct of, you know, what should we be doing when it comes to deployment. They are becoming the creators of technology uh, much more than we expect, uh, I think, around the world. What we need to do as governments is to ensure that this question is raised every single time we have a company come to us and tell us we want to deploy. Now, in certain deployments, I don't think the bias issue is, is a big issue. Um, so when you talk about RPA specifically, uh, so uh, automating processes, which governments should do more of in digitization, you won't have as much bias issue because then it becomes just understanding the, the flow uh, of certain service, services. But on the AI front, there are a lot of questions that need to be had. And our role in the UAE is to ensure that if there is a 1% chance of bias, that we don't deploy, we wait until this technology is ready and that these communities are uh, represented well. I'd like to add something, you know, so I think at MasterCard, one of the things we realized very early, you know, we are saying we're going to encourage women employment and you know, in leadership roles, not just by having numbers, right? We're also saying, how do we make the environment for women to be successful, right? They have events in their lifetime, right? They, they, they have, get married, they have kids, and many, many, many times women actually leave workplace because of those events, right? So how do we make it easy for them to come back to the workplace when they have those events? So we focused more on making it a better place for women to work versus just meeting a number, right? That's one thing. The other thing that we're doing, I think the question was around education, right? We have a global program called Girls for Tech. We are a technology company. We are focused on STEM is one area, technology particularly, even in, India, in a country like India, women do not go to engineering colleges. I, I went to an engineering college in India. I think there were only 15 girls in a class of 100, right? They just don't go to engineering colleges. How do we promote that? So we pro started this program called Girls for Tech early on, right? From, from kindergarten, you know, we teach women about technology, uh, girls, little girls, young girls about technology, right? And what can benefit, you know, how they can benefit from that. So I think this is a little bit of a journey. If we want to get to, you know, the high numbers that we want to get to, it won't come, you know, overnight. We'll have to invest in the education. We'll have to provide the ecosystem for women to actually thrive and not feel like they have to leave the workplace, you know, because of whatever event is, that is happening in their life. And I just want to add before, uh, there is a whole section now of emerging tech of, called Femtech which is yeah. exactly women starting technology companies for women health problems, for fertility, for all the things that uh, you spoke about before that if men are creating them, then it's not really, if they're creating it That's for right. women, there's a big gap there and a big uh, disconnect. Yes. Um, thanks. I, one of the reasons I didn't want to answer that question first is that it's really important that we have men allies and we have men as co-conspirators and supporters and so I want to thank the male allies that we have on this panel and that you all jumped in. The second thing I want to say is that it's mildly also depressing for me because when I went to when I was in boarding school uh, my father bought my rather fancy English accent at a British boarding school which he <laughs> sent me to when I was 10 years old. I was the only girl who was studying sciences. I was the only girl who was in science class, and therefore I had to go to class at the boys' college. I went to Malvern. I had to go to Malvern Boys' College, which was great because I became a tomboy, and all the rugby boys became my best friend. Um, so, you know, there were benefits to this. But I was the only girl who was studying science, and I went on to medical school. Today, we are still talking about educating women in science and technology. We need to move on beyond that. We need to move to a world where we are equal in this endeavor and that it is not that we're reaching out, but that, but that as um, Minister um, AI, <laughs> that's going to be your name now forever. It seems like. As he said, that you know, we, there are women who are leading this, and we, we need the policies. It is governments of the world that need to put in place the policy, policies that ensure that women have their rightful place, because indeed, we are not going to solve 
you know, maternal mortality or child mortality, any of these, and I want to bring it back to where I started at the very beginning, that we must go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. You know, there is nobody who's going to be driving. It's only a person that's alive that can be drive, that can have a driverless car. So, you know, I mean, you're not driving it yourself. And back to the AI question, why is it that some cars do not recognize black bodies and brown bodies? because there are people who are not involved in the creation of them. So I want to go back to the, you know, the, the, the whole the lighthouse and the tempest, and let's go to the lighthouse within this tempest, that we do have technology, we are involved, we're having this conversation, UAE, India, and so many of the countries of the, and other countries in the global south are leaders. What I propose is that we have south-to-south -south partnerships that help us, we have women-to-women -women partnerships, Femtech that help us. We bring ourselves together, we remove the division, and we work together towards one common goal for one common humanity. You ended it more beautifully than I ever could. Thank you very much.